This is Wild Motherfuckers! Well, hello there, my my buddy EB. How we doing today? Thrill, it's great to have you back. You were in Utah killing shit, man. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh I was hunting, so it was Big Mike. Big Mike uh didn't get one, but uh I connected on the last day, so got me a good one. And uh yeah, it's gonna make a lot of uh snack sticks. Sound of like Slim Jim, so I'll make sure I send them to everybody to get a chance to try some snack sticks. So when you kill a deer, and that's what you got, right? You got a big ass was it a buck? Yeah, it was a buck. What what do you do with it then? Now so so it's dead, and then you so, you, you put it in the back of like a four wheeler. Yeah, I mean you get it back to camp and then you clean it. Um, there are certain people that let them hang, and they want the meat to cure. Um, for me personally, I like to get the meat off the bone because instead of having a big old huge animal, you got certain like sections of meat, and it's a lot easier to handle. So. It's called deboning. I, I debone them pretty quick and knock that out. And then you get the meat and you take it to the processor and get kind of whatever you're done with it. Well, you know who else likes to debone? Bet online. Now, yeah, they do. They like to bone a lot of stuff. The world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for online betting. From the earliest odds to in-game live betting, Bet Online provides you with all the action and the ability to watch the games as they happen with the largest selection of odds on everything from football, NBA, NHL to entertainment, and you guessed it, Thrill, political props. Head to Bet Online today to get in on the action with America's most trusted site, for online wagering bet online the game starts here well now that uh we're betting online uh the 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 eb showing up on the show was anywhere from 605 to like 615 so uh you came on at 614 due to Technical difficulties because you actually came on at six oh five. All you. right, so um, but uh, I think I think Wes Tankersley won uh, won this deal tonight. So that a baby Wes. So I would say this: I would have been on earlier. I was rolling up at six oh one. Tell the story. And, Tell the story. So I had a bottle of Rumbauer, and I'm going to show you the bottle, like. It's just a nice bottle of wine, a nice Chardonnay. And I had it, (laughs) and I wanted to bring it up with me because I poured myself a glass, I put it over ice, and if I wanted to have a second glass throughout the show, I want to have my second glass. Well, I had that in my hand. I had my iPad in the other hand, and then I had my actual drink in one of the hands as well, but... Let's not forget, we here at Deuces Wild like to stay hydrated. So I had, well, you can see the kids crush from where I actually fell. Oh, and, my God. Dude, I ate shit going up the stairs and just <laughs> fucking face planted like, <laughs> but ladies, Ladies and gentlemen, your beloved co-host just bit it coming up the steps, trying to do it fast. For you yeah, guys to be on still, the show. You're not, though, because obviously I am a protector and preserver of alcohol. Yes, so you are. I corked the bottle of wine when I was walking up. Not a drop of the rum bower spilled. Now, just about my entire Buffalo Bills cup spilled. But no, fear not, because obviously there was more, and I got my ice, and the glass of wine, and we're up here. I will say that I used a towel then, and then I came on to tell you, and this is why, you know, a couple minutes late, but, you know, dude, just ain't shit. Give me a minute. It takes me a minute, too, to get the Rodex set up here. But then I used this towel, Thrill. Oh, yeah, look at you go. To clean up the mess. The I mean, rally like, the rally like, rag. How cool is that? The yeah, that's little awesome. finger, Oakland forever. And it brings up the first topic I wanted to ask you about tonight. 
So the Oakland A's are moving to Sacramento for yeah. the next one, two, three, potentially four seasons. We don't know how long. They came out today and they said the A's will no be known as just the athletics and not recognize Las Vegas, Sacramento, or Oakland, or California, How, whatever they want to do. They're not doing it. They're just going to be the A's. And so when they put up the thing like SF on scoreboards and stuff, right. it'll just say A-T-H, where it used to say O-A-K. Uh, your thoughts on this? Uh, I think once again, it is uh, pussyfying the sport. Uh, they've been Oakland for forever. They will continue to be Oakland until they move into the Vegas stadium. So call them what they are, dude. Oakland Athletics. Jesus Christ. They're just relocating for a few years until they get the damn thing built. You know, once again, somebody has their feelings fucking hurt. And uh, they, they can't call them exactly who they've been for the last 50, 60 years. So I think it's bullshit. I 1,000% agree with you. They should continue to call them the Oakland Athletics out of respect for the city of Oakland who has hosted them there since 1966. They moved an hour and a half up the road. That's right. Like, I just made the drive the other day. I think it took less than 90 minutes, actually, to get there. Now, if anything, though, if you were to change the name or put a city in front of it, wouldn't you put the fucking city they're playing in? You would, think, you would think. You would think. And on top of that, for a long period of time, Sacramento was the A's AAA affiliate. So they have a lot of history there as well. Why not use that? Dude, it, it's crazy to me that you would neglect both. And I would have been okay with both. And I think Oakland A's fans probably would have been okay with both. Where... You know what? We're just continue to call them the Oakland A's. We're only an hour and a half away. It's our way of paying homage to a city that was so good to them for so many years. Or you say, hey, look, we're very grateful for Sacramento opening their doors to us. Uh, we want to you know, show some respect to them as they play here, as the stadium in Las Vegas gets built. So I think a complete and total cluster fuck up by Major League Baseball in this one. I totally agree with you. And Wes even brought it up in the chat room. You know, he even talked about Modesto. I mean, that was their A-ball team for forever. I mean, you know, when I played in Fresno, you know, we played against McGuire and that whole gang there. And matter of fact, I even faced Tommy John in Modesto. He was on a rehab start. So, uh, you know, absolutely, absolutely unbelievable that, you know, the whole organization is kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, not necessarily falling apart, but not showing the history of that franchise and where they've been, where all their players came from, all that, which is bullshit. Thrill, so unfortunately you were, well, fortunately for you, you were out in the wilderness, like I mentioned before, killing things last week. The World Series went down. Game five, the Yankees had a 5 nothing lead with their ace Garrett Cole on the mound. The yeah, and you got to you got to figure 5 nothing with your ace out there. This is a lock. We're going to game 6. You you would have thunk, but Aaron Judge made his first error all season. Quank. <laughs> the first one takes his eye off the baseball, it falls. Uh after that, Anthony Volpe gets a ball in the hole, makes the right read, goes to third, but Throw it in the third. Jazz Chisholm doesn't pick it. So, in my mind, there were kind of two errors on that play. No, it's definitely uh, an error, without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, he's he's going towards third base. He just he just kind of rushed to throw and, and kind of, instead of giving him a full arm, he kind of cut it off and doinked it in the mud. That, hey, that stuff happens, you know. And, you know, that for Chisholm, you know, I'm not a big Chisholm fan, but it was a tough pick for him, you know, because he's got the runner bearing down on him. He's got to pick it from out in the middle of the runner. So that was tough for him. And then uh, then we got the next play, which I know you want to chat about. I, I was really interested to talk to you because being a former gold glove for a spaceman, I watched this play 
And Garrett Cole proceeded to strike out the next two guys. He gets a ground ball to first base from Mookie Betts. Anthony Rizzo goes down. It's one of those cap balls. It's spinning. It comes right at Rizzo. He stays down, right, just to make sure he secures it. Cole comes over, was trying to cut off the baseball, wasn't able to, and then just froze. Did not cover first base. Everybody is all over Cole for not covering first base. And I agree, Cole should have been there. But I also feel like Anthony Rizzo could have secured that ball. And if you look at where he was in relation to first base, as opposed to Mookie Betts, when he finally did come up with the baseball, there's no fucking way that Mookie Betts would have beat him to the base had he got on his horse and touched first base. Your thoughts on that play in that situation? Two things happened in that play. Uh, first off, you hit both nails on the head. Cole checked up. He didn't keep going first, and Rizzo stayed back on the ball. So those are two, like, you know, screw-ups that happened on the same play. We – always talked about it and this is the one thing that i've been seeing in baseball a lot here lately is like uh lack of communication and so when a pitcher is coming towards first base we were always taught to talk to the pitcher like i'm gonna get it keep going to first you know as you're fielding the ball that kind of thing that way that situation right there didn't happen where garrett cole checked up all right, second off, on the flip side of it is Rizzo. He sat back on the ball. It's a right-hander that hits a ground ball to you. This ball is not hit sharply. You need to come get that ball. You come get it. Your momentum takes you to first base, easy out. So there were two screw-ups on the same play, and it wound up costing the Yankees a World Series in game five where they could have gone back to L.A., and you never know what would happened. Thrill, I like that because I actually didn't even really think about it. I watched Anthony Rizzo field that ball. I'm like, oh, he did everything right except for get the ball and run to the base. If he had closed that gap Correct. where that ball's hit, he knows it's not hit hard. He knows it's spinning. Right. But if you could take two, three hard steps and then break down and secure it, you're that much closer to first base. Plus, on top of that, your momentum's taking you towards the bag. It's easy to make the play. Step on the bag. All right, we were taught, I mean, and, and this is what I teach, you know, our young guys when I go see them, and especially right now, this is what I'm having to teach Bryce Eldridge, is the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to land and get caught flat-footed and have no momentum going somewhere. So what you do is the timing for an infielder is like the timing as a hitter. So you want your timing to be boom when the ball is coming through the zone. Same thing as a fielder. You want to bounce or – walk into it or hop or whatever it is, and you want to hit the ground right when the ball's going through the zone, and then that way you can move one way or the other. You did it in the outfield doing kind of the same thing. That's how you got, you know, great jumps in the outfield. And so by teaching this to these younger guys, and you're seeing major leaguers not do it now, you get your momentum going. You don't get caught flat-footed. You don't get caught on your heels to where the ball has to come to you. You go get the ball. You play the hop, and you play the ball. When the ball plays you, you're going to get your ass chewed up. Yeah. Wow. I really like that, man. Go get it. You're right. Always stay on the balls of your feet. Nobody yeah. does uh, it better than Matt and that's, and that's a great thing. That is a great thing for you and, you know, Crudelli and those guys, you know, to teach it to the L LTP kids, mm. you know. It's like, hey, look, you know, let's stay on the balls of our feet. Let's, let's you know – Bounce when the ball's going through the zone so that I can move one way or the other, whether it's whether it's diagonal or whether it's coming in. This is a perfect segue uh, into the two giants that won gold gloves. Gold gloves. Guy, Congratulations. I Tip of the cap to the Hagantes. Absolutely. Matt Chapman wins his fifth gold glove, making history, doing it with three different teams. Uh, your thoughts on Matt Chapman and what he meant defensively to the Giants? Oh man, he just he just solidified that that left side of the infield. It was unbelievable. Uh, it, it was fun watching a guy that 
when the ball got hit to him, you like, ah, oh, you hit it to the wrong dude right there. And, uh, you know, that kind of confidence that Matt Chapman brings to the ball game should permeate throughout the infield. You, If you're playing shortstop next to Matt, you want to be just as good as him. If you're playing second, you want to be just as good as Matt Chapman. And so for me personally, um, you know, having Robbie Thompson, Matt Williams, Jose Uribe, myself, you know, we took a lot of pride in, you know, fielding a ground ball and the pitchers knowing that when they got the ball on the ground, it was an out. They didn't have to worry about – they didn't have to worry about a, a inning getting extended like what happened to the Yankees right there. So the other guy that won the gold glove, Patrick Bailey. I had no idea, but when you look at all the defensive metrics, they had this guy – Heads and heels above every other catcher in baseball. And they say one of the main reasons for his success as a catcher, his pitch framing ability. What did you see with Patrick Bailey this season? Patrick Bailey has great hands. And he's got such good hands that sometimes he, like, overdoes it. Sometimes he wants to frame it just that little bit and it'll actually clank a few of them, but he always clanks them in kind of non-crucial game situations. So he does a real good job. But his thing is that there's all these defensive metrics, and we go back to the analytical freaking morons and all that, and they put it on the website here, and I have no freaking earthly idea what they're talking about. He's got a plus 22 fielding run value. And then he has 16 catching framing runs, and he's got a 20 DRS, whatever the shit all of that is. All I know is the guy can catch, he's got a good quick release time, and he gets rid of it fast and lets the infield take it from there. His accuracy needs to come up a little bit, all right, because he does, you know, bounce a few balls down there to second base. But as far as catching it and getting rid of it and then letting the other guy do his job, Patrick Bailey's probably the best in the major leagues right now. Yeah, no doubt about it. Good for the Giants having a couple guys there. It's a nice yep. foundation. Then, you know, Go another thing, you even mentioned it. You know, this is Chapman's third uh, team that he's had a gold glove with, but it's also second year in a row. He had one in the American League. Now he's got one in the National League two years in a row. So uh, tip of the cap to Mr. Mister Chapman. Once again, Mr. Bailey, tip of the cap to you. You know, winning your uh, first gold glove in your second year. Uh, but there's a long way to go and a lot of room for improvement. All right, Thrill. So let's get into the top 25 free agents this off season. First, let's talk about some needs that you potentially think that the Giants might have. If they are to go after a free agent and a big time free agent, make an investment. Is there a specific position that you think they need to fill the one um the one that i've been hearing um and it and it has nothing against tyler fitzgerald tyler fitzgerald is a freaking awesome athlete but i think they want kind of like more of a full-time shortstop and the name that i've been coming across is that willie adamas from uh milwaukee milwaukee guy you know he's got some power he hit no 260 265 something like that but, um, you know, that's one of the names that I had heard was Adamas, um, and that would free up, you know, uh, Fitzgerald to play, to play second or, you know, go roam around the outfield a little bit. Willie Adamas is a stud, man. Yeah. Yeah, so that's the one, that's the one big name I've heard. Uh, you know, I don't know what's going on with Lamont Wade. I know that uh, Wilma Flores opted in, so he's coming back to the Giants. You know, he's coming off surgery, so he's going to play, you know, uh, some first base and DH and stuff like that. And then, you know, you got Bryce Eldridge kind of waiting in the wings, you know, uh, can definitely hit without a shadow of a doubt, you know, but um, this is his first year playing first base, you know, full time. And, um, you know, he's going to figure it out, but he's got a little ways to go. He's so damn young. I do love the fact that you have him coming up. I just think, though, if you're the Giants, and you have the Dodgers in your division who obviously 
ended up being the World Series champions. You had the San Diego Padres right there, who many members of the Dodgers, including Dave Roberts, their manager, said that they felt like the Padres were the best team in baseball, 1-26. to So there's those two teams. And I haven't even brought up the fucking Arizona Diamondbacks. So if you're the San Francisco Giants, dude, we got to do something. I don't know what. Yep. But you got to do something to try to keep up with the Joneses here. Am I'm, I right? I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. And and my, my big thing is, you know, <clears throat> we even talked about it last year because – we were going to have, you know, Snell was going to get hot in the second half. We had Robbie Ray coming back. We had uh, Tristan Beck was uh, coming off surgery. Uh, we had Kyle Harris and all of those guys. And I don't know, for whatever reason, kind of the pitching staff didn't really pick it up the second half like I was really anticipating. And so my big thing for next year is, and and believe it or not, I thought the bullpen did a, did a pretty good job. I mean, you know, they, they, they got used a lot this year, and they answered the call. Some of the guys had had their best years in the bullpen. But, um, you know, yeah, we got to come out the gate swinging next year. We cannot come out the gate just lollygagging around being, you know, below 500 or scuffling right around 500. We got to come out, you know, especially early in the season in our division and make a statement. Well, I love the fact – that Buster Posey is now in charge. Oh, I yeah. love that he is the president of baseball operations because when a free agent goes into San Francisco, you know who's sitting at the table with them? Buster fucking Posey. Yeah. And to have that conversation, to have that dude be the guy, I think it means a lot. Yeah. So I'm going to start with the number one free agent here on this list. Juan Soto. The ah. Giants have been linked to him. It's literally right here. Potential fits. Giants, Mets, Yankees. Do you think the Gigantes have any chance of getting Juan Soto? And if they do, FP Santangelo. I know. Ask I know you, you texted me that moron. If he can wear number 22. Yeah, oh. FP won, won enough. If he could wear number 22, you know what? Sorry, Jack. It took me a oh. while to have that freaking number put up on the wall. And you did a lot of work on that. So did Josh and everybody else in the chat room. But uh, now, uh, as far as Soto goes, dude, I, oh, man, I freaking love this guy. You want to talk about an anchor in the middle of the lineup. And he's one of the reasons why Judge drove in a thousand runs or whatever this year. Um, you know, he's on base all the time because not only can he hit, but he takes the walks too. And so he sets the dudes up behind him. Um, you know, for me, this is another one of those kind of judge questions from last year. It's like New York would be stupid not to let him go because he did set up judge and he was a main factor, you know, in the middle of the lineup. So I think New York would be stupid to let him go, but if, you know, he puts a, a Giants jersey on, damn, I'd love to have him in the middle of the lineup because we could definitely use some thump. I look at it, and I totally agree with you. How and why would the Yankees ever let Juan Soto go? I, that, it doesn't make sense. He's the reason, or at least a huge part of the reason, why Judge had the success that he had this year. Now, I'll also tell you that there are some little things that Soto doesn't do great. And it wouldn't translate really well, especially at Oracle Park, where right field is so hard to play, but he's not a great defender. So, between that and the fact that he's also not a great base runner. His leads are horseshit. His <laughs> are meh. I, I I love the the bat. It's I think he's the best hitter in baseball. Yeah. I really do, and I don't think it's close. He is that good of a hitter. But the overall package, I'm not sure if I'm going to make that investment if I'm the Giants. 
That's my personal opinion. If I'm the Yankees, though, dude, you're a several billion dollar franchise. And he just fucking proved he can have success in your park, no problem. He proved what, you know, you have Judge signed up for the next fucking 10 years or whatever it is. You need protection for him. Juan Soto's your guy. So I'd be shocked if something doesn't get done there with the Yankees in New York. Agreed. You know, and then, you know, it would be very similar, you know, in with everybody in the chat room, it'd be very similar to Giants, you know, in the 80s and 90s. You know, myself, Kevin Mitchell, Matt Williams. Then a little bit later, myself, Matt Williams, Barry Bonds. You know, you got a threesome in the middle of a lineup that just can change the whole game around, having Soto Judge Stanton. And, you know, for and then you chunk that Glaber Torres in there, they got to force them. So, um, you know, for me, you know, like I said, if, if um, you know, if you came to the Giants, that'd be awesome. But it'd also be, you know, kind of stupid for the Mets. Uh, excuse me, Yankees, let him go. Okay, so let's say he doesn't go to the Giants, right? Now, I, I also, I might not be shocked. I'm serious about this. Just listening. I get to, it. I get it. I get it. Listen to the shit that he said. I would not be shocked. If the Giants outbid everybody and Soto took the fucking deal. I, it wouldn't shock me because it seems like this guy wants that paper, man. And there's some ego in there where he wants to be potentially the highest paid player of all time. He will not get it on an AAV average annual value perspective, which Otani at 70 million is going to stay there. Now, you could give me all the bullshit about because it's deferred money, the actual contract's only worth four sixty. No, 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 no. Look, seven hundred guaranteed. I would not be shocked to see Soto get seven hundred and one million dollars guaranteed on like a fourteen-year deal. He's twenty fucking six years old. Thrill. Think about that. Like, a I lot get of it, that- dude. I get it. I get it. And that's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, you could lock him up for a little bit, but also at the same time, you you're gonna pay a premium. And, you know, the, the big thing that I don't know about, and losing Snell kind of freed up a lot of stuff, but I don't know, you know, what ownership is going to come with Buster and say, hey, you only got this much to spend. And uh, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen there. Um, while we're talking about this, while we're talking about Buster, uh, another tip of the cap to Zach Manassian, who is now our general manager. Uh, Zach was in charge of Major League Scouting. Zach's dad was my clubhouse guy in Texas. And Zach, who is now the GM, was one of our clubhouse kids. So he took a he took a little bit of a beating from the thrill he learned on the fly. He's been in baseball his whole life. And nice job, Zach Manassian. Freaking awesome, dude. I'm pulling for you. Let's get this organization back where it belongs. Yeah, that's pretty cool, man. They promoted from within. Uh, You and I talked about Buster Posey making sure he finds the right guy to be that general manager, calling the shots, doing the grunt work, and then going to Buster and saying, what do you think? Yeah. That's – I think that's everything, to have that working relationship. Okay, let's move past Soto and go to the number two free agent on the list here, Corbin Burns of the Baltimore Orioles, was with the Brewers. The Brewers traded him to the Orioles because they knew they were not going to be able to sign him long-term. This guy, when healthy, is one of the best in Major League Baseball and has been for a long time. Fifth straight top 10 Cy Young finish this year. Corbin Burns says potential fit, Mets, Orioles, and Red Sox. Meh. I don't know. I mean, could the Giants get in there? So here's the thing. So we, you know, I mean, the way things are lining up, I mean, if you look at it, we got Logan Webb, Robbie Ray, uh, Tristan Beck, Kyle Harrison, um, Hayden Birdsong, and then a host of, oh, uh, who's who's the guy who used to be a reliever, not a starter? Came from St. Louis. Um we got him in the mix too. So we got like oh, six, yeah. 
Huh? I, I'm, um, I'm drawing. I'm drawing a blank. In anyway, we we got six or seven starters right now. So to go out and to get this guy, eh, I think that would probably be on one of Buster's kind of back dealings, unless we could get a deal out of it. But Corbin Burns does have great stuff. Don't get me wrong; he's got great stuff, and I'd love to have him on my staff. But we kind of got, you know, a backlog of starting pitchers and. We need to just keep yeah, it yes healthy. Yes, no, no thrill. Fuck, can you ever have enough? Like, no, you never have enough. No, you never have enough. enough. You stock pop. Jordan Hicks. Thank you, Pete. Sorry. Jordan uh, Hicks. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Jordan. Uh, I drew a blank on you. My bad. Sorry. Uh, uh, Jordan ain't watching this shit. But, but Jordan. Anyway, this is so we respect so, your I mean, you know, if you got more, then you can shift other guys around. You know, yeah. if you can put, uh, you know, Let's say Jordan because he's been a reliever before you sure. kick him in the pen. Yeah, um, you know, let him get his velocity back up if he wanted to, or you know, a, a young guy like like Birdsong, put him in the pen and hey, dude, chunk it as hard as you can for a few innings, and I guarantee you he'll start throwing ninety nine, hundred. So if there's one thing that the <coughs> Rodgers and Yankees, I think, both proved to us this year, these are the two World Series teams. It's that. You can't have enough arms, period. I don't give a fuck, man. Period. Dudes are throwing harder than ever. The shit's going to go. It's essentially gone on everybody, right? Yeah. So they're now. Yeah. All of these guys, all of these guys from this generation, all right, wait till they get 45, 50 years old. Every freaking one of them going to have surgery. I promise yeah. you. All this shit's coming going to come back up to him. All of them, all of them ligaments, they're going to be gone. It's crazy. They're throwing too hard. So I'll say this. The next guy on the list is Blake Snell. So if you're the giant, so, and I'm in negotiations with Blake Snell on a long-term deal, which is said to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars, a hundred plus is what I last saw. Yeah. I'm also going to be in conversation with Corbin Burns. Because those guys are relatively similar when it comes to what they have. Now, Burns may be a little more reliable uh, just on the consistency of health, but Snell was as dirty as anybody. I ran into Blake Snell thrill a couple weeks ago in Las Vegas and had an amazing conversation with him. And he was talking about free agency. And I'm like, bro. Where do you want to sign? Yeah. And he looked me in the eye and he goes, Bernsey, I just want to win. And and I I've heard that a million times from you know the free agents that are giving you the cliche and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. But as we were talking about the playoffs, because it was right in the middle of everything, I could tell this dude wants to pitch in the fucking playoffs. Yeah. That matters to him. So yeah. when yeah. you hear that, it's you have to dig deep, right? But I do think he would take less money to go to a team that he believes is going to be in the playoffs year in and year out. That well, and matters. Here's another, here's another thing, too, is he has already said, and it is on the computer, it's in articles and stuff, he said that he loves San Francisco – and he likes the makeup of the team. So you never know. You never know. Maybe Buster can work his magic. We'll see. He was the best pitcher down the stretch. He went 5-1.23 yeah. ERA and 14 starts. Yeah, but he's got to go deal with Mr. Boris. So good luck. All right. Number four on the list, Alex Bregman. Uh, obviously a third baseman. Uh, you could move him to second with Matt Chapman at third. I mean, this could be. Somebody, I it just seems like a great clubhouse chemistry guy. Yeah, I, no, I, I, I love I, the I, 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 I kind of agree with you, but also disagree in that, you know, if they're going to try to get a, a guy like Adamez, they're going to move Fitzgerald over. They're going to need to stay save money some sort of way or another. Fitzgerald's a second year player, so they get him fairly cheap, whereas Bregman is going to be high dollar. Yeah. Let's see here. Number five on the list is Max Freed, a quality left-handed pitcher. 
He's 31. Bregman's 31. It's amazing how these free agents become, they're all like 30, 31. Anthony Santander is another interesting one. Uh, 30-year-old outfielder from the Baltimore Orioles. This guy's legit. Uh, Santander? Yeah. Yeah, he had, he had 44 and had, I don't know, 122 or something like that this Holy year. shit, man. That's the second Orioles guy that you have brought up. Our former organization, by the way, you and I. Yeah. So there you go. Little, little little here, man. For the Orioles. But yeah. anyway, um, you know, I I think he's another one kind of similar to, well, he's Soto's better, but I, I don't think he's that A-plus outfielder, so I think he's more relegated for a DH role. Uh, Mike says I'm fucking 50 and I have my second, I had my second shoulder surgery. I didn't play baseball past high school yet. Yeah, Mike, yeah. here's the deal though, bro. Everyone knows that you're 76. I, like it's okay, man. I know you got this facade telling people you're, you're, you're 50. Dude. Especially, especially when I took the shirt off the other day, it's like, Oh my God. Oh my God, Santa! Put it back oh, on. You became, you became a legend for that. Yeah. Hey, uh, your wife's on here, Miss Tara. What's uh, what's the smell of vision, Tara? Yeah, Fire that one up there tonight. She's talking about defense wins championships. I do agree with her because check you check this stat out, Thrill. The Yankees, there's two things. There's two things that win championships: pitching and defense. They do. Totally agree with you. Without a shadow of a doubt. So this this year in the postseason. The Yankees actually out hit the Dodgers. Not kidding, dude. But guess what? The Yankees ran the bases like fucking idiots. They played defense like a gosh damn fucking 11 U double A team. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was horrific, right? They didn't do any of the little things and it cost them. The Dodgers did all the right things. Things when it came time to get a runner over, they did it. When it came time to get a runner in, they did it. So even though they didn't have the stats, they hit. I think it was like two oh six compared to the Yankees two twelve. They hit eight homers. Yankees hit nine homers, and they were all they're basically pretty similar. But they did all the little fucking things, and gosh damn man, it could have been a sweep, and they got it done in five. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep, you're right. You're All right, right, so here we go. So right, wait, 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 wait. while we're on that, while we're on that, let's let's not deviate too far from that. You know, you've heard my tirade, F the Dodgers, all that sort of stuff. But I am also a baseball realist. All right. When I look at the Dodgers, especially offensively, not necessarily pitching wise, but when I look at them offensively, the one thing that I do see that they do probably better than anybody else is they make you they grind out at bats they don't swing at bad pitches and they don't strike out a ton no and you know you got that kind of mentality you got that kind of game plan and all of a sudden you start putting pressure on the other guys because you put the ball in play all the time now they got to make now they got to make plays all the time look what happens when you make plays all the time sometimes you boot shit and we win the game so Thrill, Freddie Freeman obviously was incredible in the World Series. Ended up being the World Series MVP. Had the iconic walk-off grand slam yep. in game one. As yep. a fellow left-handed hitter, what do you see from Freddie Freeman that you admire? He just, you know, I mean, Freddie's one of those guys that, you know, and, and even playing first base too, you know, I just admire his whole game. Uh, you know, grinds out at bats, hits for a high average, you know, got the pop, got the RBIs in there. But then he also has that next gear where he steps it up during the postseason. And I love guys like that. I have been a Freddie Freeman fan in the past, and I'm a Freddie Freeman fan now because of those reasons right there. I mean, you know, you can say whatever you want, you know, about Otani and all that sort of stuff, but, you know, him and Mookie hold down that whole team right there. Game on the line. Dude, Freddie Game Freddie. on the line. I don't want him up there. I do not want I, him up there, you know. 
I'll you want to figure I'll out who your best hitter is? I'll pitch around him to get somebody else. Fuck yeah. If you want to find out who your best hitter is on your team, ask yourself the question. If the game is on the line, bases loaded, bottom nine, two outs, your dude's up there. Pick whoever you want up there. Who is it? If I'm a Dodger fan, it's Freddie fucking Freeman. You Pick. got it. You got it. Another guy. Another guy, too. You know, I tip my cap to him. You know, plays every day. He don't take days off. He plays freaking every day. I love it. Love it. Hobbling. Oh, and by the way, you got a little uh, chicken and dumplings tonight on smell vision so you better get ready, Jack. Tara is breaking out the Southern tradition, baby. Yeah. Well, Thrill, I got the new Traeger smoker, man. I've been oh, look at you. Going. Look I, at you. It's been so awesome. Look at you. You coming to see the Thrill down south. Do some smoking, baby. Dude, it's next level. The, uh, the meat, it just melts in your mouth. The oh, yeah. fact that I can perfectly cook it even with ADHD. I'm <laughs> good. <laughs> Hey, you know what you you know what you got to do? All right, you got to put it on. You got to set all your shit, and then go freaking play a ball game with your kids and shit, and just let Tara check on it. Well, that's it. That's what we did last week. We started. We were smoking. I don't know. We had a tri tip. We had oh, some nice, hands. nice. That's perfect. And then don't don't even get on them ribs. Don't even get on them ribs and gnaw on them bones, baby. Mm. Woo! Mm. So hey, back to Freddie Freeman for a second. I wanted to ask you about this. I'm not sure if I've ever seen another hitter from the left or right side, doesn't matter, be able to pull his hands in as well as Freddie Freeman does it. It literally looks like it could hit him in the shoulder and he'd find a way to get his barrel there. That's, that's pretty that's unusual. The one thing, that's the one thing that is like – above all of the stuff that he does, that's the one thing that stands out for me. It's yeah. just the fact that how good he is at pulling his hands. And when he does pull his hands, that elbow doesn't leak like that. He pulls his hands and keeps everything flat, and that's why he can rake. And then don't even start falling into a pattern where you go away from him. You go away from him, he freaking beats you the other way. So same thing. It's incredible. Okay. The number eight free agent on this list here is Willie Adamas, the guy you were talking about. Yeah, there you go. Boom. We already said it about him. Uh, he's linked to the Giants. He's linked because there's been no, you know, no uh, quietness about, you know, since we lost Crawford, we need a, a, an everyday, you know, kind of go glove type of shortstop. And from what I hear, Adamas can bring that to us. So we'll see. Question for you, though. So – he hit 32 home runs. He drove in 112 runs. He's a fucking shortstop and a damn good one as well. He's number eight on this list. Pete Alonzo is number seven in front of him. I like Pete. Pete's a, a, a nice slugger. But if you're telling me who can I have for the next 10 years, it's fucking William Thomas. I get what you're saying. I get exactly what you're saying, you know, but... You know, my thing, and, you know, I mean, this is kind of where the game's gone, but you and I, you and I have talked about it before. Is I think some of these contracts, you know, signing these guys for 10 years, dude, that's way too much. You know, let's, let's go back a little bit. Let's do the three to five year contracts. And, hey, uh, you have to produce, by the way, in those three and five years. Otherwise, <laughs> see ya next, you know, don't. I mean, these guys want to, want these, you know, multi-year deals, a 10-year deal. Dude, I mean, you know, some of these guys are going to be 42 in, in yeah. their last, you know, year of the contract. There ain't no way they're going to be the same kind of hitter they were when they were in their 20s and early 30s. No, but, okay, here's the thing about Willie Adamas. So, Adamas, like I said, all these guys, 30, 31 years old, right? Adamas is 29 and Juan Soto's 26. That makes them different. Especially yeah. Soto, obviously. Yeah. That's why Andy's so good. You'd have to be willing to go 14 years and bank on the fact that the kid's going to be able to hit until he's 40. Look, Otani's proved, now he's done it with his legs as well, but he's proved that a DH can have that value, right? Can add the wins yeah. above the placement. Yeah, he can have that value, but you got to go 50-50, Jack. Like, Jesus, yeah. you know? 
I know. I know. Um, okay, I mentioned Alonzo at seven, Willie Adamas at eight. Then you got guys like Jack Flaherty. Ah. He's, he's nice. I'm not, I'm not going out of my way to sign him. Put it this way, he did he did a real good job this year. I mean, you know, he he did a good job, you know, for Detroit. And then, you know, the Dodgers scooped him up and he finished up strong with them. So, uh, you know, he might be one of those, you know, diamonds in the rough type thing that you might be able to get him on the sly and he might be one of the better ones of the group. Really interesting. The next guy on the list is actually a relief pitcher, a fucking left-hand relief pitcher, Tanner Scott. He was with the Marlins. Uh, ended up with the Padres, and I mean, I don't know. He had one point seven five ERA, twenty two saves. Uh, it's a it's a nice thing, but I, you know, Shane Bieber's at number eleven. Are you gonna put him above Shane Bieber? Like I like Bieber. Bieber's a fucking stud. It's been good for a long time. That, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, as as far as pitching goes, you know, like we just talked about, you know. Pitching and defense wins ball games, and there is going to be somebody that he's going to be able to step in and help immediately. Um, on our end of things, you know, kind of—I don't know—they, you know, they uh, they let Taylor Rogers go through the waiver wire because they wanted to see if they could, you know, have somebody pick his up, up his salary. His salary was eight million, I think. And nobody even bid at it, so they got Taylor back in the deal. So, all right, here's a couple other guys. Uh, one guy I think that you and I would both like to add: Christian Walker. Oh hell yeah! Even for the Arizona Diamondbacks, this yeah, guy. I mean, nothing, happy. nothing, nothing fancy, dancy, nothing that freaking just jumps out at you, but. The last few years, at the end of the year, you look at him, you're like, Jesus, this guy had a freaking great year. And on top of that, he plays a real solid first base. So, gold yeah. Club. He was a yeah. Gold Award winner. Yeah. But you also getting in on that, all right, if we sign him, what happens to Eldridge? How, how far do you push Eldridge back? And I know they're trying to rush Eldridge right now to the majors. He's not ready, by the way. Uh, he needs at least another full year in the minors and, you know, especially on a defensive side of things uh, and kind of go from there. So, but if you sign a Christian Walker, you're going to have to sign him for, you know, a minimum three, five years. So I was going to say, give him fucking three, three for 50. Yeah, no. Right. Bring, yeah. I bring Christian Walker in for three for 50. Yeah. And guess what? As soon as Elders is ready, let's go. Christian yeah, Walker. bring him, bring him up, and, and DH. Well, Giants have that shit for a DH. Well, and then here's the thing. Here's the thing. Walker can become the DH, DH, yep. and he could also mentor Eldridge at first base. Oh. So yeah, I, I, I get where you're coming from. Okay, uh, then we got Nathan Evaldi, veteran, uh, right hand yep. pitcher. He's been around for forever. Forever. The guy. Here's the next one that really piques my interest. And this is a guy I know you fucking love because when the Dodgers signed him, you were pissed. Teoscar Hernandez. Yes. Yes. I was like, Jesus, we could have got him in a freaking steal, you know? And and look what he winds up doing, you know? Wins a, the home run derby and then had a had a real good second half this year. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, he, he would be another one just kind of like Walker. I mean, you know, if you could, if you could find a – a good deal for the Giants. Yeah, he'd fit in there, no problems. Yeah. Uh again, we got some starting pitchers. You got a uh, veteran starting pitcher, Michael Waka. You got uh Ha Sung Kim. This is a really All right, that's that's a guy right there. He's been linked to the Giants because yep. of Bob Melvin. All right. Bob, okay. had him, Bob had him in San Diego. Another thing, too, is he is a good friend of uh, Lee, Jung Hu Lee. He's he's a real good friend of him. So he has been linked to the Giants as far as the shortstop goes. But for me personally, if you're going to get a shortstop, uh, let's try to get somebody like Adamas that can thump a little bit. We don't need just a another slap guy because we need we need to uh, keep the line moving. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's. 
been known as being a great defender. When he was at second base, he basically led the world in every metric you could think about. Uh, after that, at number 17 is Carlos Estevez. I don't even know who the fuck he pitched for. Let's see. He had a 2.45 ERA, 26 saves between the Angels and the Phillies in 2024. This just goes to show you, like, I, I respect the fuck out of relief pitchers, but when it comes to them making a name for themselves, it's really tough outside of their hometown. Yeah. It really yeah. is, man. If you don't play every day and you're not a starting pitcher, I don't, in the grand scheme of things, no one really gives a fuck. Yeah, or, or you're just flat out dominant. You know, you just come in and slam the door. Nobody's going to, you know, 24 saves. It's like, okay, all right. You know, and then you turn around and you look at, like, you know, Bobby Thigpen with 50-something and K-Rod with 60 and, you know, the people like that. You're like, shit, they ain't even got half of what those guys had. Well, the closer duties these days are just yeah. super hot. Right, yeah, that's kind of how, how I it goes. Yeah, yeah, I get We're it. Eighteen here, Clay Holmes. Uh, Holmes was obviously he was with the Yankees. Uh, he looked good down the stretch. Uh, you, then you got Kikuchi. Uh, let's see here. It said the Astros paid a hefty price for Kikuchi at the trade deadline. I mean, he was with Toronto. He had a four seven five ERA over twenty two starts, but the veteran lefty was stellar. For Houston, going five and one with a two seven zero. So obviously, Houston saw something that they liked in Kikuchi. From a metric perspective, they knew that he was going to get it right, and he did. So he was great down the stretch. Number twenty, I didn't even know this. Clayber Torres is a free agent as well, the second baseman yeah. for the New York Yankees. So yeah, you see, I even I even brought that I even brought that one up earlier because I knew he was a free agent too. Wow. 21 is Tyler O'Neal, who he ended up with the Red Sox, right? 847 OPS in 113 games for the Red Sox. 22, Sean Manaya. Sean Manaya, I, you know, there's a guy that's, I, I, I like Sean Manaya. I, I just say, yeah, he's always just a fucking dude. Takes the ball, big games, going to go after the hitters. I don't feel like this guy's here. 3.47 ERA and 32 starts this year uh, with the Mets. Then you have 23, and this is interesting. You ready for this? I don't think, I don't think we use Manaya the way he should have been used while he was here. I'll just say that. So there you go. Okay. 23, Max Scherzer. He's 40. I mean, fuck, 40. I, I played with Max. Yeah, he's 40. 40-year-old Hall of Famer. Has made only You're a Hall of Famer. Look, if, you, if you're going to make a run, sign him for one or two years. You know, he's going to he's going to do his thing, you know. It says he can still pitch at a high level when he's healthy. Scherzer will obviously take a massive pay cut from the forty three point three million dollars he earned last season. Yeah, massive, in other words. Yeah, but this is a guy I want on my staff, man. If I could pull him in for a few million bucks, I yeah. Absolutely, right? Well, and especially especially if <clears throat> you bring him into our situation and he's able to, and I've said this before, he's able to mentor Beck and Harrison, Birdsong, people like that. He could have a big effect on those kids. Okay, number 24 here is Jurickson Profar of the San Diego Padres. His one-year, $1 million with the Padres proved to be one of the best signings of last offseason. 24 homers, 85 runs driven in it, 839 OPS in 158 games. So he's obviously going to get a much bigger payday this go-around. I was not a Jurickson Profar fan, never have been, and he proved me wrong. He had a fabulous year this year. Uh, one of the reasons why the Padres were where they were um, you know, and so, you know, I tip my cap to him. He had a, he had a hell of a, hell of a year this year. So, uh, yeah, he's going to get a little bump in his payday next year. Okay. And the 25th best free agent, at least according to MLB.com is Luis Severino. He bet on himself. He signed a one year, $13 million contract with the Mets last winter. He then went 11 and seven with a three, nine, one ERA over 182 innings. His highest total since 2018. Severino should be able to command a multi-year deal 
this winter. I don't know, you know, whether or not the Giants would be interested in a guy like him. But I'll go back and reiterate this, and I can just say this till I'm fucking blue in the face, man. You can't have enough pitching. You just can't. Well, without a shadow of a doubt, you can't have enough pitching. You know, and and for the most part, you know, when pitching is on, it doesn't go in slumps. I mean, it it freaking rocks and rolls. So, and pitching is is and should be the backbone of your team because no matter who that guy is out on the mound, and it's proven right now because we only had seven guys in the major leagues above 300 this year. Uh, the other guys make outs 70% of the time, no matter who's on the mound. So, boom, there you go. Okay, and then the bonus one they have here, Thrill, is Roki Sasaki. So, let me explain this to you. Roki Sasaki. Yes, 23 years old. Yo, it, 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 I'm going to read this to you so you understand what's going on here. All right. Nobu Yamamoto's move to the majors caused a bidding war last offseason. And while the potential of Sasaki coming over from Japan would carry the same excitement factor. His age would prevent a similar free agent frenzy. Players younger than 25 years old who have not reached six years of service in a foreign major league are subject to MLB's international amateur signing bonus pool rules, setting a cap on their contract. Shohei Otani faced a similar situation in 2017. He signed with the Angels for $2.315 million. Sasaki has a 1.95 ERA over his first four seasons in Japan and would become one of the top available starters if he were posted. So we don't know if this is going to happen, but this could be an absolute steal for somebody. All right, then. Yeah, he just... Uh, I don't know anything about this guy. All right. Um, there you go. There's your 25 free agents. How it will affect the Giants? We have no fucking idea, but I'd like to see them get in there and at least one or two of those guys. Yeah, no, I get, I get what you're saying. I get exactly what you're saying, but, you know, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, Buster's got his work cut out for him because, you know, he's going to have winter meetings coming up. Um He's probably going to pitch, you know, his direction of where he thinks the team should go. And then the ownership group has to give him feedback on, hey, look, we need to stay in pat. We can spend a little money. How much can we spend? You know, that kind of stuff. So there's uh, there's a lot of stuff going to be uh, happening here in the next uh, month or so. Your overall thoughts on the Dodgers and what they've put together? because. Quite honestly, dude, it's a dynasty. And I get the fact that they only won the championship in 2020, which was a COVID-shortened season, and then this one here. But the fact that they've won 11 out of the past 12 NL West championships, they're consistently vying for a World Series title every single season. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, when you win 11 out of 12 championships, that means automatically 11 out of 12 years. You're in the postseason. And, you know, needless to say, that's where, you know, that's where you make your moolah as uh, Wes just chunked in the chat room. That's where you make your dollars. But, um, you know, they they got an ownership group that gave them a freaking open checkbook. And, uh, you know, they took advantage of it and look what happened to them. But, you know, I, you know, for me personally, it's like, dude, you, you can – you can only spend so much, you know, there's, there's, there's like a ceiling. I mean, where, you know, I look at a guy and I go, and, and you've done it too. And so is everybody in the chat room. You look at a guy and you're like, man, he's a real good player, but he's not a $30 million player. And you look at another guy and you go, he's a good player, but he's definitely not $20 million player. And that's where the game's going. The game's getting kind of out of whack. So, Here's something interesting. Joe Kelly went on a podcast, reliever for the Dodgers, and he was saying that in scouting reports, the Dodgers basically informed the players that the Yankees 
were going to go ahead and shit on themselves. They were not great defensively. They don't run the base as well. So let's continue to pe- the, you know, put the pressure on them by putting the ball in play, by doing all the little things uh, correctly. How much of that, you know, I, I think, you know, say with, you know, with the Giants, right? Like, you're there. You deal with all these minor leaguers. How much of that is actually fucking taught? Is it taught? Base running. Give me, like, let's just start there. I mean, are we not fucking teaching base running anymore the way we used to? Not like it was back in our day. I got to I gotta legitimately, I mean, you know, when I go around to our minor leaguers, I have to legitimately go, all right, look, there's a left-handed center fielder. If he's going into left field, you want to take the extra base. And they, like, look at me and go, why? And I go, because he's running into left, left field. He has to stop and get turned around and throw, or he has to stop and do a 180 and throw on the run. I said, you need to take the extra base. And they go, uh, nobody taught us that. Well, I'm teaching you. All right, I'm teaching you. And the, the opposite goes for the right hand to going into right center. Same shit. That was stuff that was talked about all the time. Nobody talks about it now. And on top of that, we did not have an outfielder instructor. And for the most part, we didn't have a, a base running instructor this year. It was other coaches assumed those duties. Look, man, I'll go work for free. <laughs> if you want me to go in there, I'll work with the minor league guys. I'll work with the big league guys. I don't give a fuck. I'll go work for free just because I want to see it done right. Yeah, no, I'm just with you. What? Hey, why do you think? Why do you think I go do what I do? I don't get. I don't get paid to go into the minor leagues. I don't get paid at all. I get paid to be in San Francisco. And to do what I do in San Francisco, what I do in the minor leagues is all stuff that I'm doing because I'm trying to give back to the game. So cool, man. Really is. Dude. I, that, that's the beauty. Dude, that's, that's how dude, I feel. I love winning. I told you that. I hate to fucking lose. In those three out of five years where all of a sudden I got a freaking World Series ring, I like those World Series rings. I need more of them. All right. In order to have more of them, you idiots have to do it fucking right on the field. And I'm going to teach you how to do it right on the field. You remember Ron Plaza? Third base coach for the Big Red Machine. Oh, Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, I knew I heard that name before. Old crusty guy. I I had him as a a coach. Yeah. Special assistant with the A's. And so he taught he taught me base running. And he taught me shit that I could have never fucking dreamed about. And one of them was when you're at third base, you get as much of a lead as a third baseman's giving you. So if the third baseman is 20 feet off the base, he wants you taking a 20 foot lead. Yeah. And then when he, t- and you just, all you got to do is look at him. He takes a step back, you take a step back. Step back, step back. Oh, he goes that way here. And so. Yeah. In today's game where all the shifts, I watch it all the time. Guys are taking like 10-foot leads off of third base, and you got the third baseman playing fucking shortstop. Yeah, yeah. He's he's, he's, like, 50, dude, feet, he's 50 feet away. Why don't you get halfway down the line? You can get halfway down the line. Yeah. All no, you got to do is get him back. You just got to keep your eye on him. That's yeah, it. There, there, are so many, there are so many things that I was taught either as a younger player or I was taught in college because – my college coach was unbelievable. One of the things that well, I, had to, I had to explain this like three or four times this year was fly ball to the outfield and a guy's standing there and he's like, he's like looking over his shoulder, getting ready to go, you know? And I'm like, dude, uh, turn your chest towards the play and get yep. ready and just break like you would as a sprinter. I said, but you got your chest turned. You can see the ball. You're not looking over your shoulder, one of those numbers. And, you know, the kids would come up to me and go, who, who taught you that, Mr. Clark? I said, damn near every one of my coaches when I was growing up, you know. And, this, and it applies to third base, third base. It applies to second. It applies to first, you know. Another thing, and you and I talked about this, and everybody in the chat room, y'all should have known this by me, is 
when you get on base, do not put your head down. Do not lose track of that baseball. All right? I never, ever had one of those hidden ball fucking tricks put on me because I was like, throw the fucking ball back. I know you got it. You know? That kind of shit. Every one of these motherfuckers now, and, and you and I talk about it, you know, they come into third base, the, the play's still going on behind them, and they're going, woo, 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 and they're giving fucking signs to everybody in the dugout. I'm like, what the fuck? The fucking ball's live behind you. You know? So, anyway, I just, I, it's it's stupid, some of the shit. I'm going to give you another example. So, there's a thing in baseball, it was taught to me, it's called, it's called a second secondary. So, basically, if I hit a double, and I'm coming into second base, like Thrill's talk about, instead of doing my double celly <laughs> over the second base, maybe we'll do a little this, we'll do a little that, whether it's the running man or the fucking lawnmower, whatever. But once I get to second base, say you have a runner on first base, and that relay is going home, that ball's thrown home. When you hit second, you're now at second. You're like, okay, I'm secure here. Well, now we have a second secondary. Boom, boom. We hop off and we're reading the fucking throw going home because if that ball kicks away, then we go. Agreed. Totally agree. Without a shadow of a doubt. And that's what you do when you keep your eye on the ball and you pick it up and you consider that, hey, the play's still live here instead of, oh, I did my job. All that bullshit. Get the fuck out, man. Come on. You know, these guys, I don't I don't get it now. I really don't get it. It's different if you fucking get a base hit with bases loaded in the bottom of the eighth, all right, to put your ass in the World Series. You get on first base, you're like, fuck it, yeah, one of those numbers, all right? But when you get a base hit in 162 games during the middle of a regular season, you don't get on first base and all that sort of shit. You get on first base, you look at the dugout. Hey, all right, good job. See ya. All right, where's the ball at, by the way? Uh, Emily Thompson, thank you. She appreciates my dance moves. And I, I'm actually was was doing the sprinkler. I call Emily, it the thanks for the Field of Dreams bourbon, you and Joel. I'm trying to find some more bottles, by the way. I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find the bottles that got my little face on the corky thing. So we're, we're gonna. I got MLB tracking that shit down right now. Love it. All right, thrill. I got to roll, man. I got dinner now. Chicken and dumplings, Tara. Chicken and dumplings. We got we got a, a bottle of Rumbauer just partially spilt. That yeah, yeah. Half of it's on the freaking uh, steps as you come up to your abode. You know what was funny about that thrill is is Tara was downstairs with the kids, and when I crashed on the stairs. It sounded like a fucking car wreck, man. I mean, it was just... <laughs> and you know what? In this house, apparently, they're so fucking used to it, nobody said a word. No. Nobody. No, no, you, know, no. you know what it's like? You know actually what it's like? Tara has got so used to it. The kids got so used to it. You have a fucking black bear in your fucking house and nobody pays any attention to it. Oh, That's I paid where it you live. Part. That's where you live, bitch. That's certainly where I live. All right, Thrill. Well, let me know uh, if you would do it next week, dude. We, there's always shit to talk about, man. I'm, I'm on next week. I'm on. All Let's right. do it. Let's do it. We we can figure some shit out. Plus, on top of that, we hadn't had any uh, knockers in a while. Uh, we're not going to have Big Mike come on and fucking strip naked. Uh, maybe we can get some of the other regulars. Maybe Linda. Linda, break it out. Come on. Come see us. Uh, the Battleborn Mike thing and showing up with his shirt off and I, you know, <laughs> I was really controversial, man. A lot of people, <laughs> you know, a lot of people loved it, and a lot of people were like, "What the fuck, man!" And now he's sitting in the dark. What's Jesus. up, you little bitch? What? What? What, <laughs> what the fuck, man? You know what? You know, fuck you guys. I'm not in the dark. <laughs> It isn't dark. You know, I'm, I'm wearing my shirt. I fucking, oh, I, 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 I follow the fucking rules. Fuck you guys. <laughs> and I like seeing your big old titties here, man. We said I don't have titties. No filter network. I don't have titties. Oh, here we oh, go. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Look at that. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> All right. All right. Yeah, guys. 
This, this was a fucking great show, man. It was glorious. I loved watching you guys talk your talk. Um, and my two cents that are not valuable, but Juan Soto is the greatest hitter in baseball currently at his age. I won't, I won't down. disagree with you at all right there. Would you be like of all time? No, 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 but I'm not that fucking old. I'm only 50, dude. Uh, but I do, I do know the stats of the guys that came before the oh, guys yeah. that came no, before yeah, the guys. You ain't, you ain't shitting. So, uh, but I, I, I'm pretty high on Juan Soto. That that's a guy. He's a little bit arrogant, like that. I like Love that. that. Needs to be. Um. He definitely needs to be because he's yep. freaking that good. But he that he is the might might be not necessarily, but might be this generation's greatest hitter. He may be. Agree. We'll see. Agree. No, he's saying his ability to take walks his next level. I haven't seen a guy like that since Bonds. Now he doesn't do what Bonds does, but he's it's his eye. Is the best. He does not swing at a fucking ball out of the zone. He nope. does not swing at a ball out of the zone. He, yeah, he doesn't fuck around. He doesn't waste uh, swings. Agreed, Burns. Agreed. And that's, uh, why, that's why, you know, that's why, you know, you, you guys that are in a chat room and here on the, on, uh, on the show, you've heard me say it before. I never turned around and asked anybody, hey, was that a strike? I knew if it was a strike or not. I mean, I've, I've been up at plate. I know exactly what a strike and what a ball is. What I'm doing is I'm setting the umpire up. I'm trying to say, hey, is that as far as he can go? And then that way I can adjust my game to whatever he's calling back there. And uh, also he knows that, hey, this guy knows where, uh, all right, that was three inches off the plate. He knows that that ball's off the dish, you know? And so anyway, so that's that was a different time back in the day. But as far as Juan Soto goes, you know, and I told Burnsy this, I'd I, Take him any day of the week, but it would be freaking stupid for the Yankees to break up that pairing that got him into the World Series and then had some success last year as well. So, final question here, and I got to roll, boys. Uh, Battleborn, is yep. our guy Trump? Is our guy Trump going to pull this off? Fuck yes, he is. <laughs> Trump. <laughs> 20, 20, fucking four. Let's I noticed, go. I noticed you had it on Fox News the whole time. You didn't ask me any political questions, so thank you. Nah, we just want to make sure everybody can keep up to date with what's going down. A lot of undecided, man. A lot of swing states undecided, so this is awfully early. Yeah. But, Nevada yeah. going to Trump. That's what I'm telling you right now. Okay. Okay. Right, I, Nevada and Arizona are fucking – really, really big states. If he could take Nevada and Arizona, I think that'll do it. Dude, until they cheat, we got this. <laughs> well, you know what happened to me last time, right? I was a registered voter in Arizona. So I had a house in Arizona. It was like the whole thing was legit. I got my absentee ballot mailed to me. It officially says it went out on this date. And then later was reported that my ballot, along with thousands of other ballots, mysteriously went fucking missing, which was bullshit. I, so I still am calling fraud for the last fucking election. Fucking fraud. Bullshit. Agreed 100%. 100% agreed. On that note, hey, on that note, we love everybody. We like to keep things down the middle here. This, you didn't come here to get your politics. All good. So uh, love you guys both. See you next week. Uh, Battleborn, anything, uh, anything, uh, final words for tonight? You know what? This was a fucking glorious show. Enjoyed every bit of commentary and fuck you.
it's just enough. <laughs> you, know what? you know what? You know what? He did hit. He did hit the nail on the head. I mean, you know, with the exception of like the World Series and like the free agents, we really didn't have anything to talk about. This came out to be a good show. We always got some shit to talk. Oh, hell, you know us. You know us. We make shit happen. So, all right, thrill. I will be here uh, next week. So, same time, same bat channel for everybody in the chat room. And for everybody else, thank you for joining. Oh, if you listen on Apple, Spotify, please leave a review. Five stars if you're feeling generous. Write a little something. We really appreciate that. It would help us in the uh, rankings and uh, rocking and rolling. Just get more people to be able to share and eat Deuce's wild love. That's it. That's right. And we're going to find a way to TikTok some shit. Always. See ya!